Hello gamers and welcome back to another episode of Solo Spelunking. And today it'll be a special episode because as you can see from the setup here, I'm not in my usual gaming den um, because I'm in a bus on a business trip right now and I'm in my hotel room. But since I'm almost at 500 subscribers, I said to myself, I want to post one video a day until the end of the week in my Race to 500 series. And I will hopefully have 500 subscribers by the end of the weekend. So to reach this goal, I will just um, yeah put out a video every day until the end of the weekend. And uh, the topic I want to talk about today is how to play published adventures solo. Because this is a topic that is of interest to a lot of solo role players, at least from what I have gathered by um, reading different forum posts on this topic. And um, for me, it is also not a very easy topic because when you play a published adventure, you always have these conflicting interests between maintaining some element of unpredictability and surprise, but still following the published adventure. And this is, I think, a difficult part, uh, a difficult task to accomplish. And I also think that it is actually not possible to be completely surprised by playing and published adventure solo, but maybe this is also not really necessary. And I will try to show you or talk, explain to you why. So this is, uh, uh, as you will, uh, a table talk. So there will be no gameplay in this episode, just me talking about how I play published adventure solo and I'm giving you some examples. And uh, before I start, of course, I got some some um, yeah, agenda prepared. Before I start, a little disclaimer. I do not play a lot of published adventure solo and uh, all these things that I talk about are also not all of my own um, devising, but it's... Uh, It is some information I've gathered from different sources that are out there that deal with this topic. And I will also put links to products that I have used in the past in the video description. Um, if I manage to do this, because this is a crude setup here, but still. So, um, of course, the important question is why? Why would you actually want to play published adventures solo? I think it's not really surprising, but we should um, first yeah, talk a little about, about this question, why you would actually want to do this or why I want to do this. So this is another disclaimer. What I'm talking about here is my own opinion, my own experience. I'm not an expert on this topic. And this is how I do things. And if you want to do things in a different way, that's of course completely fine. Um, so I want to share my methods and my reasons. And so this is a little disclaimer. So why? Well, for me, one of the most important, important parts is if I want or if I play a published adventure, I can Let's do it like this. I can relax my creative muscles. So if you're using generative sources like random idea generators, oracles, it's a lot of work for you as a solo GM to always like, yeah, come up with interesting interpretations, ideas, and storylines. And sometimes you don't want that. You just want to play with your favorite role-playing system. You want to get some dice out, maybe push some minis around, maybe not, depending on the system, and just want to experience a good story. So therefore, 
if you play a published adventure, you can relax your creative muscles. The, the basic groundwork, the framework is set. The boundaries are set. The theme is set. You usually don't have to think about important NPCs or, or monster encounters because it's already been done for you and you can just enjoy it. So this for me is actually the main reason. It gives me a set structure and framework. It limits my, my campaign or gaming sessions to a storyline. And sometimes this is all I want and all I need. So that would be my my main reason for playing a published adventure solo. Then, of course, the second reason for me would be to take advantage of the vast material that is already out there. So there are tons of adventures published and a lot of them are also available for free or very little money if you go to drive through RPG or DM Skilled, a lot of fan-created content and um, yeah, why not take advantage of all this good stuff and let it go to waste? So just get a few adventures. You probably already have more adventures than you have played. And take advantage of what you have and, and put it to good use. Which also leads, of course, to the third reason, obviously, to just use your collection. Maybe some of you, at least I know I have, have a lot more adventures than they have actually played. Because when I was into fourth edition, I also bought a lot of adventures just to get the maps that were included uh, that I could use for skirmish games or scenarios. And um, then when fourth edition was coming to an end, a lot of these adventures were reduced or on sale. So you could get a lot of material for very little money. But of course, I never played all these adventures. So now they're sitting someplace on my shelf. And now with solo RPG, I finally get to use my collection of adventures. So these are my main three reasons for actually wanting to play a published adventure solo. So this is the why. So now we have to ask ourselves actually how do we do it? How do we go about the process? Which brings us to the topic of preparation. So there are some things you need to do before you, you start playing the adventure. And this is, and now we, we touch on the topic of the conflict between maintaining surprise and using what is already provided. You should read the adventure outline. So usually these published adventures uh, in the beginning section of the adventure, they have like a section for the DM, like an adventure overview which introduces the main story arc. It introduces key points in the adventure, key objectives, and it introduces you to the main NPCs or villains of the adventure. So you should read this adventure outline and you should read it so that you have the boundary set, that you know what the main context is for the story you are about to play because as you will see further in the video you will of course use some generative sources to alter aspects of the adventure but it is easier if you are restricted to a theme a storyline an antagonist or an antagonist group it in my experience, makes it easier to generate elements that fit the story and that complement the story. But in order to do that, you need to know exactly what the story is. So this is why you should read the adventure outline. And, and of course, you should familiarize yourself with the major characters of the adventure, usually the beginning section of an adventure includes things like important NPCs, protagonists, 
or maybe the beginning of every act of the adventure if it's divided into chapters. Um, so you should at least have a good idea of the main movers and shakers of the adventure. And you should note key events and goals of the adventure. And the example would be my Reavers of Hakenwald adventure that I played in my series. There, of course, before I started, I read the adventure outline, so I knew what it was about, what the theme was, that there was a mercenary group that have invaded a barony, imprisoned the rightful ruler, and that they were ter um, terrorizing the public, the local folk. And this was the main overarching theme and it gave me a framework to fit my generated encounters and events into this framework. And of course I knew who the major players were, that Nathan Redthorne was the leader of the Iron Circle, Baron Stockmare, the imprisoned Baron, Dargrimoth, the leader of the Harkenwald Rebellion and some other folks like um, um, uh, Bren Torsen from Tors Hold and um, Old Keller, the Dwarven Stone Master or Stone Mason who could tell you about the castle. So that's important that you know who the main movers and shakers are. And the adventure also told me what goals I needed to accomplish to basically beat the adventure to defeat the Iron Circle. And this set the boundaries and gave me the framework um, to, to yeah, act within. So, of course, that my, this might ruin your surprise. Because I already knew who the villain was and, and what I was supposed to do. But I think, and now we, we come back to the why, the reason I'm playing a published adventure, the main reason for me is because I want to relax my creative muscles. I want to go easy on myself, give me a little break from improvisation and just use something that is provided to me or for me. And in order to do this, of course, I need to know what it is about. Otherwise, no, I wouldn't need to play this published adventure if I start making all the things up by myself. So this is what I mean with preparation. So you should do this before you actually start playing so that you know what you have to work with and in what context all your efforts uh, are embedded in. And now we come to the elements that even though you're playing a published adventure might still provide you with this unpredictability and uncertainty that you like when it comes to solo role playing. And these things are those four points. So what can you do to still maintain a little uncertainty, a little unpredictability and a little surprise even though you know what the main story is and you know who the main protagonists are. And these elements are, or um, principles are, alter, expand, rearrange and randomize. And I will talk about these uh, topics now and I'll give you a few examples um, for every one of them and if I'm able to I will also show you when I used this technique in my Reavers of Harkenwold adventure series because I didn't use all of them all the time sometimes I just was too lazy but if you really want to go all out on on playing a published adventure but combining the best of both worlds like the unpredictability of the generative method and the ease of use of the provided content, um, yeah, you could use all these uh, principles to make it an enjoyable experience. And I will talk about these now. So the first thing you could do is alter. And with alter, I mean 
you could alter the scenes using Oracle rules and random idea, idea generators. And I didn't use this principle when I was playing Reavers of Hardenwold. At least not in the way it is intended in this context. So in this context it would mean that when you have a scene or encounter as depicted in the published adventure, you would at the start of the scene, just like if you would use Mythic and set up a scene, make an oracle rule to see if the scene is somehow altered or interrupted. And if that is the case, you use a random idea generator to generate elements that you could add to the scene to, to change the experience slightly. And of course, within the context and theme of the main story of the published adventure you're playing or more generic. So examples include, for example, you could add weather conditions, you could add terrain elements, or you could add additional goals and or timers. And even though I didn't use this technique playing Reavers of Hakenwold, I want to give you an example how you could use it by so if we go back to the first encounter where I was uh, on the way to the village of Allbridge and I came across this farmhouse where the Iron Circle was harassing this woman Iliana. The encounter was like Iliana's plight or something. It was the first, first um, encounter of the adventure. So let's say I wanted to add some additional goals and or timers. I could change up the encounter in a way that maybe the Iron Circle that they already have set the main farmhouse on fire and barred the door from the outside. And Ilyana and her son, they are trapped within the farmhouse which is on fire. So now I have a timer and an additional goal. My goal would be to defeat the Iron Circle brigands to be able to to open the dwarf because it's barred from the outside to rescue Ilyana and her son before they die in the flames. Even though it's not a major change, it still provides a different experience to the provided material that you have. So you don't need to do much creative work because you can just use the encounter as it is you just added something to spice it up a little. And this is what I mean with alter. Or here it says at weather conditions. Let's just say, all right, so this is the encounter as it is described, but we have very bad weather, a thunderstorm, so we have limited visibility, maybe when it comes to ranged attacks, so ranged attacks are more difficult. And maybe some areas are already muddy and slippery, so we could declare some squares as difficult terrain if you play a, a miniature-based system. Um, or you could even make more, um, more impactful alterations. Depends on, on how you feel and in what kind of mood you are and how important it is for you to get a satisfying experience out of it um, how important it is for you to change up the encounter. So in this first encounter, I was perfectly fine with just playing it out as it is. So sometimes I just like a good scripted story that still is not set in stone because the outcome depends on my dice rolls and my actions, but I can live with it if it's not a real surprise and if it's happened as described. But if you um, don't want to do this, you could implement this technique of alter and it um, it is more suited i think to um, those outside encounters than to to dungeon crawls for example i will co cover that uh, as well so that is what i mean by alter one method to spice up an encounter to provide some surprise even though it is uh, yeah, detailed. All right, so let's go back to this card and you gotta excuse the sliding setup here. Um, you know how these hotel rooms sometimes are. You don't really have a bright ceiling light. You just got these, 
these night lights so this is uh, a little bit dark but I think or hope you can still see it all let me get this a little bit over here but it's just more glare but not really more light all right so we covered all two now the next thing or technique would be expand So what do I mean by expand? You could expand the scope of the adventure by adding encounters that are not detailed in the adventure or by adding minor quest goals. And to give you an example of that, uh, my journey to Allbridge in my Reavers of Hagenwold adventure, um, after I rescued Ilana, uh, where I had the encounter with the Iron Circle Patrol that wanted to collect a toll on the road. Maybe you remember, for those of you who watched the series, I think it was session one or two or so. And this was something I just added. And this is what I mean why it is good to read the adventure outline and everything in advance. I had a clear context. I knew, all right, so um, we have this Iron Circle and they're patrolling, they are harassing the people. And so it was easy for me to add this encounter and to, to enforce the theme of the adventure with this encounter. And it also was basically a minor quest goal because the goal was to get Ilyana and her son safety to the village of Allbridge because we we're not sure if maybe the Iron Circle would come back to retaliate after they discovered that some of their people died at her farmhouse. So this is what I mean by expand. This is especially suited in more sandboxy adventures where you might be have a lot of, of overland travel or a lot of town interaction. So some um, elements in the adventure where you are free to move around uh, in, a, in a sandboxy manner. There you could easily add some spies to the adventure by, by adding encounters and you would still relax your um, creative muscles because the encounter it, um, no, not the encounter, the adventure it provides you with a limited scope of encounter possibilities, which makes it easy for you to come, come up with something because you are more focused. So this is what you could do, you could expand. Now back to our main overview here, rearrange. What do I mean with rearrange? So this is actually something and I read this in a resource, I think it was the Dungeon Oracle by Paul Bimler and I will, like I said, post a link in the description. Um, that means if your adventure features a dungeon, usually you have like a printed dungeon map and there you could break down the dungeon map into segments and generate the dungeon randomly by however, but by using the segments that you created by dividing the provided dungeon map. And I do not mean cut it apart. I mean, you could do this. You could just make a photocopy and, and cut it up and, and basically create your own tiles that you um, rearrange randomly. But you could also do it by just um, yeah, making a note on, on, on a piece of paper which um, how, in how many areas uh, you divide this dungeon and, and what keys are included in your areas that you divide it and then you could just roll a die for the area. Let's say you divide up your dungeon into 10 areas and then you would start with an empty piece of graph paper and roll your d10 and if it's a 6 your dungeon starts with area 6 but area 6 is of course described in the adventure meaning you do not need to come up with the whole dungeon idea and you do not need to use a full-blown dungeon generator but you still have no idea when you will encounter what and how the dungeon layout will be even though you know the different elements and then you could also just read the the description of the sections 
when you're required to do so when you enter them and maybe read the sections from the neighboring sections to see if there's something there that would react to your actions. And if you make some minor mistakes because you, you um, haven't read something that you should have read or so just alter the Uh, the things accordingly. So this is why it's also important to, to read the important goals and quests beforehand and you have an idea what you need to include for the adventure. So maybe uh, if there's something in a room that you can only, the problem you can only solve if you have collected something else first, either alter it slightly uh, or come back later or change it in a way that it, it works. So you, you will have some some adjustments that you make but most of the work is already done for you so this is a special good technique if you really have a classic dungeon crawl adventure it does not really make sense for example if you if we want to give you if i want to give you an, another example um, of a D&D adventure that I didn't play, but Lost Minds of Fendelver. For those of you who know that adventure, and I think maybe it's even available for free now, uh, in this village in Fendelin, there's this old mansion, the Red Brent Hideout on the hill, like an old mansion. There, for me, it does not really make sense to break up this map because it's not a dungeon, it's a mansion, and the mansion follows a logical outline. So it wouldn't make sense if you go through the main door that you're immediately in the bedroom because you rolled randomly bedroom. So there it uh, it makes sense to keep the layout as it is and rather use other elements like um, expanding the encounters or altering the encounters or, um, and I come to this Uh, now in my next and last um, example when it comes to randomizing either use one of these techniques but this is another good example where you could use this is the D&D adventure uh, keep on the shadow fell because there one element is a classic dungeon crawl a very small dungeon I think like eight nine ten rooms or so which do not follow a logical pattern there it would be no problem to to rearrange this dungeon by random dungeon rolls so that you actually explore the dungeon as you go but you still keep the provided material or use the provided material so this is what i mean with rearrange and this brings us to the last technique randomize so what do I mean when I talk about randomizing stuff? What can you randomize? You can randomize decisions and dungeons, but keep the main quest room. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back to the, what I said, um, adventure keep on the Shadowfell where I set the small dungeon. One way would be to, to rearrange it, like I said. But the other way would be if you're in a room and you have three doors and there's no indication that indicates that one way is better than the other, just roll a d3 and pick the door randomly. Because your characters, they would not have a reason to choose one over the other. And by choosing the door randomly, it's basically like a reverse random dungeon generator. You are still a little bit surprised because you will not know in what sequence and um, in, in what order you will encounter the provided encounters that are described. So this is what I mean by you can randomize decisions. It's either if do I go left or right, first or second door or whatever. And, and this is where I got the example, You could randomize the dungeon completely, so do not rearrange, like cut up the dungeon map, but use a random dungeon generator of your choice, like, for example, the x deck of many dungeons, but keep the main quest rooms. And 
opponents and villains. And the example would be my exploration of Dalnister in my Harkenwald adventure, where I had to kill this undead wizard to recruit the Woodsinger elves. And there, because it was a fourth edition adventure that um, was very combat heavy, this Dalnister monastery only featured like two combat encounters. So it didn't really even have a dungeon map. So there, if you remember what I did, I used the x mains deck of many dungeons to create the dungeon randomly, but I already had my goal and my quest to kill this undead wizard, and I knew that the quest room would include, or that there I would encounter the wizard. So I could still relax my creative muscles, because I didn't have to waste any thought about what could be the main villain and, and what kind of abilities might he have, because this was provided in the adventure. Of course, in this special case, because I used a different rule set, I couldn't use it as is, so I used it as inspiration. But would I would I have played it with fourth edition rules and fourth edition characters, I could have just used the encounters as they are. So, of course, I'm assuming that you use the RPG system Uh, that the adventure was created for, to minimize your efforts. So, but this was one thing I did, and you could also do this, like, for example, um, with another adventure. So, if you do not want to rearrange the dungeon map, but you know the adventure features a dungeon crawl where you have to get a certain item out of a dungeon, and this item is guarded by a certain boss monster. You could keep this part of the published adventure, And even if you encounter a monster using your random dungeon generator, you could use the monsters included in the adventure module to, for example, to again relax your creative muscles. But the dungeon layout with traps, maybe secret doors or other unimportant rooms would be created randomly. And there you could basically combine the best of both worlds. You have a clear goal, you have a clear dungeon boss, you have a clear main quest room, and also maybe a setting when it comes to monsters that you could use for random encounters because the theme of the dungeon is set, but the layout of the dungeon, this is randomized by, by a different supplement. Yeah, so... Those are basically the things that I use um, to, to play a published adventure. And like I said, I gave you examples. I didn't use Alter in Reavers of Hakenwold. I expanded by adding encounters, mostly when I was doing overland travel. I rearranged. Oh yeah, another thing um, when it comes to, to rearranging, or this might even be more uh, of an alter case. Um, when we go back to Reavers of Hakenwald, there was also this quest element where I had to defeat the Bullywugs in their cave. And there also, maybe this was, I'm not sure if it was alter or if it was rearranged, because I used this, this goal as inspiration. I knew I had to kill the Bullywugs and they're in a cave. But to play this, I used my my uh, book of battle mats with some sort of you if you remember a token and more of a miniature skirmish mechanic. So there I also added other elements, but used what was provided. I used the story elements and I used the monster types. And of course, in this special case, I had to do conversions because it was a different system. But then again, if I would have used fourth edition, I could have just used it as is. But to keep myself surprised, I used this mechanic of, of the, the cave dungeon map. So this is what I mean by combining generative resources with predetermined yeah, monster types and encounter goals. Yeah, so you could alter encounters by adding minor things and details. You expand the adventure by adding different encounters. You rearrange um, dungeons by dividing up the map and rolling randomly, or you can randomize player decisions if it makes sense. So I think 
these are my key concepts that I use when I play a published adventure and they provide me with a good balance of boundaries but also um, possibility for improvisation and creativity and they give me the unpredictability that is enough for me to enjoy a published adventure even though I know the story and the villains in advance. Yeah, so these are my tips of how to play a published adventure solo. So I hope I could shed some light on the subject and I hope you enjoyed this video even though it didn't feature any gameplay. And if you did, please do like and also please do subscribe. And let me know what you think in the comments. And as always, uh, stay safe and stay healthy. And I'll hopefully see you in the next video. Bye-bye.